Okay, uh, first off, I'd like to start out by uh, following in Greg's footsteps from last time by saying that the topic I'm about to present on, the people who are referred to as situationists, would assert that uh, situationism does not exist, and that's a nonsense word coined by anti-situationists. Anyways, uh, the Situationist International uh, existed from 1957 through 1972. It was international, but it was um, primarily French-based. Basically, the uh, precedents uh, for situationism are art movements such as Dada and Surrealism. <clears throat> um, Dada, for those who aren't familiar with it, was an art movement that arose um, in the wake of World War I. Basically, people were upset with the bourgeois culture that had produced such a mass slaughter such as World War I. So they tried to reject all of the bourgeois values, including art. So they, were they would consider themselves an anti-art movement. And so they tried to... Uh, basically just create images and ideas and things like that that would uh, shock people and were anti-aesthetic, that didn't have any aesthetic precedent to them. Um, the Situationist International was formed out of uh, several different organizations, which all merged in 1957. One of them was the International Movement for an Imaginist Bauhaus. Uh, basically, they um, were an architecture and design type group uh, that were anti-functionalist, whereas usually the, the, the original Bauhaus kind of manifesto was form follows function. The imaginist Bauhaus would have, called, would have said form follows fun. Uh, another um, organization was the Letterist International. Basically, they existed from 1952 to 57. They were basically like the French beatniks or something like that. Uh, there was also the London Psychogeographical Association. Now, psychogeography is, uh, as Guy Debord put it, uh, the study of precise laws and specific effects of the ge geographical environment, consciously organized or not, on the emotions of behavior in individuals. So basically just uh, the idea of the effect that the environment has on the, on the psychology of the person. <clears throat> uh, so, Situationist, Situationist International had both kind of uh, an artistic wing and a political wing. The artistic wing was uh, represented by people like uh, Asger Jorn and uh, initially Guy Debord. And um, the political was uh, Raoul uh, Denain, and later Debord would become more of a political uh, type of person. Um, <clears throat> basically, the artistic wing of the Situationist International sought to integrate art and politics. Uh, and art in everyday life. They rejected art as, the spe as a specialized practice of you know, trained artists. Um, one of their key concepts was unitary urbanism, which was uh, first promoted by the, the Letterist uh, organization. And that was the idea that uh, art and your environment should be integrated. They rejected functionalism. Um, See, as Gil J. Woolman said, uh, a unitary urbanism is the synthesis of art and technology that we call for. It must be constructed according to certain new values of life, values which now need to be distinguished and disseminated. Uh, hypergraphy which, uh, was one of the ideas that kind of led to this, which, is, which was the merging of writing with other media as opposed to just reading a book. There would be you know, images and other things that, would, that they brought into that. Um, some of the art that, uh, that in individuals in the Situationist uh, did were um, Asger Jorn did what he called modifications, which basically he um, appropriated paintings uh, by unknown artists and then he would paint over them in kind of a uh, kind of a modern expressionist way, kind of just to say that we can appropriate um, aspects of, of bourgeois society and turn them into something else to kind of I don't know, shock people or something like that. Uh, Giuseppe Pino Galizio, he did um, what he called industrial paintings. Basically, it was a parody of mass production where he would get giant rolls of canvas and he would just kind of paint just random, random patterns on them. And he would, um, <clears throat> he would come off a roll and he would sell them by the meter. He wanted to trade entire cities in industrial paintings. Um, Guy Debord made uh, six films. Um, which he took off the market for about 20 years. Uh, one of his films was, uh, was just uh, basically found footage, and every time there was dialogue happening, it would show white people, and then when silence was occurring, he would show black people. In uh, 
And our project that Debor and Yorn did together was called um, Memoirs. It was a book. Yeah, the intro to it was by, written by Marx. It, go, it's, it was just a quote from him. It says, let the dead bury the dead and mourn them. Our fate will to become the first living people to enter the new life. Uh, the book was bound in sandpaper, so when they would file it on a bookshelf, it would destroy the books around it. Um, it incorporates, uh, basically it was, there was, it was built in two layers. So um, the first layer would have been print and things like that uh, appropriated from, from society at the time, maps, newspapers, things like that. And then uh, over the top of those, to kind of interrupt uh, the, per the person who's reading it, the, their flow of thought were uh, kind of splashes of colored ink and things like that. Now, um, the, uh, the newspaper clippings, the maps, the advertisements and things they used in that, that was uh, an idea that uh, was called, that the situation is called the spectacle. Now Guy Debord kind of came up with a spectacle and he wrote about it in his book, Society of the Spectacle. Uh, and here's a quote for him, from him on that, this, which is, the spectacle epitomizes the prevailing model of social life. It is, it is the omnipresent celebration of a choice already made in the sphere of production, and the consummate result of that choice in form as in content, the spectacle serve, serves a, as total justification for the conditions and aims of the existing system. Now, in developing uh, his theory of the spectacle, Debord kind of drew on um, two ideas from, from Karl Marx, first of which is commodity fetishism, and the second is reification. Uh, commodity fetishism is basically the idea that social relations have been transformed by capitalism into relationships between objects. So, the producers are unaware of who, are, who, for who is going to consume their, their product, so they're alienated from them in that sense. Consumers are unaware of who produced the product, so their relationship with one another is through the, commo is through the commodity itself. Now, reification is basically the idea of attributing concreteness to, human, to abstract human constructions. An example of this would be like the idea of God, who is a projection of uh, human imagination, which begins to then... Uh, have autonomy and rule over human behavior. Um, and a quote from Karl Marx, which I think kind of encompasses this idea, is a commodity is therefore a mysterious thing, simply because in it the social character of men's labor appears to them as an objective character stamped upon the product of that labor. Because the relationship of the producers to the sum total of their own labor is presented to them as a social relation existing not between themselves, but between the products of their labor. There is a definite social relation between men that assumes in their eyes the fantastic form of, re of a relation between things. In order, therefore, to find an analogy, we must, we must have recourse to the mist-enveloped regions of the religious world. In that world, the productions of the human brain appear as independent beings endowed with life, and entering into relations both one with another and the human race. So it is in the world of commodities with the products of men's hands. This I call fetishism, which attaches itself to the products of labor so soon as they are produced as commodities, and which is therefore inseparable from the production of commodities. commodities. So Debord's idea of the spectacle is basically a commodity, commodity, <laughs> commodity fetishism and reification as they are manifested in advanced capitalism and in modern society in general, particularly through the means of mass media. Um, for instance, Television. When we watch television, uh, well, well, children for today are kind of raised on television. They gain a lot of their understanding of what the real world is through television. So in that way, it mediates between us and the real world. And in that way, also, media becomes, uh, becomes its own version of reality. And if you look at the history of kind of, of mass media, like television in particular, when it first started out, you kind of had to have more sensationalistic things in order to take people away from reality and bring them into this relationship with, uh, with this abstraction, right? So you had to have, you know, it either had to be news, you know, of like, you know, some war happening someplace, or it had to be, um, you know, some sort of exciting serial or something like that. But now, since it's so, since the, since television and the spectacle have been so ingrained into our everyday lives that we don't even need that. Basically, we can just our, our reality is, is so much uh, subsumed by the spectacle that we can just turn on the TV just to watch reality TV, which is people engaging in ordinary everyday activity, like we should be doing instead of watching TV. Uh, DeBord said the spectacle is not a collection of images, but a social relation among people mediated by images. Now, this 
to me sounds a lot like things such as um, Facebook or even how we're, you know, we mediate our relationships through a technology um, or say in computer games and things like that. Uh, people who spend a lot of time on Facebook or play a lot of video games, you know, they think of themselves as having done something really interesting that day. Like, oh, I went, I went and I was doing all the social networking for it. Oh, I was, you know, battling some orcs or shooting terrorists in an airport or something like that. But really, all they were doing is they were sitting in front of a screen, moving their fingers occasionally. Um, whereas the capitalist mode of production alienated workers from, the pro from their product, the spectacle of advanced capitalist societies takes alienation even fur further into the leisure and, so and social lives of consumers. The authenticity of human life becomes replaced by its image in the spectacle. Advertising no longer sells us a product, it sells us an image of authenticity, an image of ourselves which we live through proxy. Real experience or adventure are replaced by the image of these activities, um, like, in a, like in, a, in a car commercial or a beer commercial or something. They, they're not really selling you like on the great taste of the beer or like the superiority of the car. They're selling you on kind of the image that goes along with those particular things. You know, they're like uh, with a with like a, a fancy like a new compact cheap car, and they show these hip people driving around in it. You know, having this real hip time going to the beach or something. Right? They're selling saying that this car is you, and you should buy this car. With a, with you know beer commercials, people are really having a fun having a fun time and a good time. So they're really selling you the 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 authentic experience, the, instead of instead of the actual product. Um, <clears throat> and this quote by Larry Law: "Things that were once directly lived are now lived by proxy. Once an experience is taken out of the real world, it becomes a commodity." Um, and basically, another aspect of the spectacle is that it puts society into a, in a, into a passive and receptive role a, instead of a proactive and creative one, because people themselves don't create the spectacle. The spectacle is, the spectacle is created, and then we consume it. And so we're kind of set up into, this, uh, into a receptive mode in which we just kind of accept everything that's being fed to us. Um, DeBoer argued that there, uh, later went on to uh, expound that there were three different aspects of the spectacle. There was a concentrated spectacle, <clears throat> which basically channel, channels uh, human, desi human desire and concentrates it so that it is identified with a, with a bureaucratic class. Authenticity then is represented in the form of a political leader and uh, kind of creates a cult of personality around them. You see this in fascist countries with Mussolini and Hitler, or in um, authoritarian socialist countries such you know, with Stalin and Mao or Fidel or even Che. Uh, then there's the diffuse spectacle. Uh, which is accomplished through the competition of different spectacles, uh, Coke versus Pepsi, or uh, even more accurately, uh, New Age spirituality versus traditional Christianity and their associated consumer choices, like yoga mats and organic food versus Walmart. The diffuse spectacle gives the illusion of cultural diversity by permeating all of society and entering into niche markets. Um, DeBoer argued that uh, the diffuse spectacle was a lot more effective than the concentrated spectacle. Um, but then he went on to say that there was oh, there's also the integrated spectacle, which basically combines <coughs> aspects of the concentrated and diffuse spectacle, market freedom and state control. I would say that that is best epitomized by, I don't know, the, by today and mostly by like things initiated by the Bush administration and the way they were able to use media to their advantage to promote a state agenda. All right, so this brings us to the next key concept of situationism, which is the situation. The situation is the proposed response to the spectacle and to capitalism in general. Uh, capitalism and the spectacle seek to rep repress human desire and freedom, so we must, so in response to this, the situationists would say we must create uh, we must create situations in which human de desires can be realized. As uh, Raoul Venheim said, down with a world in which the guarantee that we will not die of starvation has been purchased with the guarantee that we will buy, die of boredom. Um, play, because it's done for the sheer joy of it and not for its productive value, uh, then becomes a very central concern to the situations. <clears throat> Uh, De Board said that a revolutionary organization can no longer combat alien alienation by means of being alienated forms of struggle. So they, in this way, they reject self-sacrifice and say that uh, that, the, that the means of resistance to capitalism sh uh, should 
be enjoyable in and, of those, in and of themselves, that we should do it just for the sheer joy of doing it. Um, a few ways in which they propose to do this are, one concept is the diternamon, uh, which is to appropriate, appropriate aspects of the spectacle for use in, non -spe in a non-spectacular way, in order to disrupt the this, this spectacle and shock people out of their passive receptivity. Examples of this are the book Memo uh, Memoirs by Jorn and Deborg, where they, that, uh, that they portrayed the spectacle and then they kind of, you know, uh, they detourned it by, by uh, juxtaposing it with more creative, uh, creative forms. Um, <clears throat> another, another example is a film by René Vianette called Can Dialectics Break Bricks, which basically they took a, uh, an old samurai film and then they dubbed over it in French and completely changed the plot so that it was about, um, it was about the proletariat rising up against the bourgeoisie. Um, and then another interesting example of a determinant is um, I heard once of, in, a, in a school somewhere on the East Coast during the Cold War uh, when uh, they were supposed to go out and have a, <clears throat> have a, nuclear, have a nuclear drill, which was basically you know, just kind of a scary tactic to get people to rally uh, support against the Soviet Union. Uh, some certain students, instead of doing that, went out and got a bunch and got in their bathing suits and got uh, a bunch of sun sun tan things you put around your neck. Don't know what those are called, but you know, in order to say like, hey, we're going to get tanned by this nuclear bomb that's going to hit. Um, another uh, another concept that they that the uh, situation is proposed was the dire uh, the derive, which uh, is also called the situationist drift. <coughs> Uh, and Debord said of these, uh, derives involve playful, constructive behavior and awareness of psych psychogeographical effects, and are thus quite different from the classic notions of journey or stroll. In a derive, uh, one or more persons during a certain period drop their relations, their work and leisure activities, and all other usual motives for movement and action, and let themselves be drawn <clears throat> by the attractions of the terrain and the encounter encounters they, fight, they find there. As justification for this, uh, De Board cites a study where a researcher uh, diagrammed all the movements made in a space of one year by a student, uh, student living in Paris. Uh, basically, he found that our itinerary forms a small triangle with no significant deviations, the three apex, the apexes of which are the school of political science, her residence, and that of her piano teacher. So basically, her movements were completely uh, motivated and controlled by her role in the capitalist society. So the, the derive seeks to replace our understanding of our environment, which is currently dictated by our role in a capitalist society, you know, through the commute, to one created by ourselves for the, free, for the sheer playful experience. So he said that uh, for, a, for somebody to do this properly, they need to set about, about, a, day, about a day and just kind of have no destination in mind except for a possible meeting place at the end of it and just let themselves be carried through the city by their own desires. Um, now, uh, the situationists also thought that mass revolts were, de were definitely situations in which um, uh, people could break them from the, from the chains of capitalism. So mass revolts where authority can no longer protect and enforce the values of capitalism are seen as situations in which authentic human de desires can be realized. In the Situationist International Periodical Number 10, uh, regarding the, the looting that happened during the Watts riots. Um, <clears throat> once the, uh, they said, uh, once the vaunted abundance is taken at face value and directly seized instead of being eternally pursued in the rat race of alienated labor and increasing unmet social needs, real desires begin to be expressed in festive celebration, in playful self-assertion, in the potluck of destruction. People who destroy commodities show their human support, superiority over commodities. They stop submitting to the arbitrary forms that distortedly reflect, reflect their real needs. So basically, the idea is that people really only, really only strive for these consumer goods because they're kept, because they're kept at arm's length, and we, you know, it's kind of the object of our desires, which keeps us participating in the capitalist system, keeps us selling our time to get these things. But once they're free and available to us, to us, you know, the kind of the absurdity of this notion is is. Is, is shown because they're free to everyone, and then people re like realize that you know these things might not be what brings us joy. <clears throat> the situation is thought that ideally revolts and riots should turn into revolutions, 
This was the hope when the student protests of, in Paris of May 68 turned into a general strike, which almost caused the collapse of the French government. <coughs> May 68 was the first wildcat general strike in history. The union bosses and communist party leadership sought to use it as an opportunity to demand various reforms from the government. The workers, however, uh, had felt empowered and realized that the power to control society was really in their hands and had been radicalized, and they rejected these demands. The situationists urged them to use this opportunity to do away with the capitalist, with the capitalist and union bosses and instate council communism. Uh, the implementation of council communism by, uh, by way of occupying the factories and kicking out the bosses uh, was seen as, a, as a, the revolutionary means by which human desires and freedom could be realized. According to the situationists, the ability of workers to control their workplaces and society at large would allow them to reduce the work day and eventually eliminate work as a co coercive institution completely, thereby bringing to realization the idea that all, that all of existence should be a matter of, uh, of play and of the manifestation of human desires. That's it. Any questions? Um, it seems that a vast majority of these arguments depend on some notion of human desire. What is human desire for the situationists? That, that would be my question, too. What, what sure. is, did they have a precise definition of what it means to be desire? I actually don't know what their precise definition is. I think more the emphasis <coughs> is on, is on the, the free choice of individuals to decide what they, what they want, independent of coercive institutions such as capitalism. Can I make a brief follow-up then? Um, then in that case, what oh, uh, what grants someone an epistemic position, right? How, how does someone know um, or that they are in a position to adjudicate the difference between right, so-called fake desires and so-called real desires? What is the mechanism by which one determines that, for example, a plasma screen TV is a fake desire, um, but... I'm trying to find the least hostile way to put this, um, but perhaps not as egalitarian philosophy as situationism uh, or right unalienated labor or unalienated play is a real desire. So how would what what's the mechanism by which one adjudicates that? I think the word you're looking for is what is the authentic desire. Um, well, I'll, I'll just offer my question as well. Um... Yeah, obviously that's a pretty <clears throat> difficult question to answer. Um, I would say that we could look towards, um, I guess, I don't know, like that question is up to really anybody to answer. I would look towards uh, situations in which people are, uh, well I think, okay, I think the situationists would say that, that um, that plasma screens and TVs and things like that were created by bourgeois culture and that those are, that bourgeois culture has tried to impose those desires and wants onto people through the means of uh, kind of oppressing people in the workplace and things like that where people need to compensate for that. I don't think that they can necessarily say uh, absolutely that a plasma screen TV is not someone's desire, but I think they would they would cast doubt on the idea that that is someone's true desire, and just based on the fact that it is a product of bourgeois culture. Um, so yeah, the, the precise definition I, I know Greg and I both use this definition of desire, but desire specifically is a demand without a satisfaction. Right, it, it, the desire of oh, I want that plasma t TV, but what I really want is to be me enjoying that plasma screen TV, right, on a or whatever, and also the desire to play, right. It's not necessarily there's still that minimum, there's still a level of alienation from desire, because it's like uh, something's wrong with me, but somehow this this fantasy, this situation where I'm playing and we're not being alienated, that's still uh, an unattainable desire in and of itself, simply because, right, you're still identifying with yourself in that fantasy rather than identifying with who you are. So the very notion of desire itself is always alienated from the subject. So that's just more of a general comment. So. Isn't, isn't the emphasis, I mean, isn't the perspective though that it's a detachment from who you are? Like it's a detachment from, the, from what everyone is in a, in a primitive sense? Um, 
like I, you know, I'm not an expert on it, but um, I think the des desire for, there is an inherent difference between the desire for a flat screen TV and the desire to have sex. Um, there, there's a lot of steps in between. I mean, the desire to have sex is pretty innate human drive. There's a lot of steps yeah. from, from that desire to the desire to have a flat screen TV and right. watch pornography. But you also hit it on the head. It's a drive, right? Sex is a drive. Um, the very, the very fantasy, right, which maintains sex, because without, without a fantasy, right, what is it? It's just a bunch of repetitive motions you're doing with your partner, and there's, there's nothing really special about it. But it's, it's actually that fantasy space that you enter into that actually makes it something that you desire for. Also, but does that make sense? Also, I believe that claim could be somewhat, at least, made a little bit more complicated by the notions that are in, um, studied in queer theory. You know, the, the desire to have sex, okay, but with who, and why, and how, and what, you know. I mean, all those things, right, to say that if we stripped away all these things, that you would still want this loving, caring relationship and stuff like this. I'm not saying that you couldn't have that. What I'm saying is to assume that all those things that are involved in sex are just kind of unladen themselves in this reconfiguration of desire, bringing the drive into desire, um, I think, you know. It's simply not as simple as just saying, well, people want sex, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to call on Dea. She has her hand up. Um, and I have three questions, actually. And two of them are really closely related to this. Um, but one of them is um, how, how exactly, I know you mentioned, you know, that we choose to mediate ourselves for technology. Um, and it's about um, active and creative versus passive and receptive. Um, but for instance, reading a book, like, is that like if you're reading fiction, are you necessarily engaged in spectacle? Um, I, like, reading books is is often a passive act for me, often extremely passive. I, I have a hard time being an active reader, but I still see that as like a very desirable thing to do. Um, my, I'm gonna go ahead and list all three of my questions in the interest of getting them out. Um, <laughs> So number one is, in terms of technology, how do you draw that line? Number two, you mentioned at the beginning um, that, like, Stalinist revisionists would say that the term revisionist was merely invented by anti-revisionists. What do they call themselves? Is um, it? Oh, go, go ahead. Sorry. Um, and then the third question is, um, when you... Um, When you when you say that you want to go from riots to revolution, to me that necessarily entails a certain level of self-sacrifice, and I'm curious how that is integrated in this philosophy. Okay, so first question about uh, technology and, and books also being <coughs> a form of receptivity. Um, I don't think the situationists necessarily would find any uh, would find as much problem would find as much problem with. Uh, reading, um, but I think people that uh, follow the situationists uh, that kind of took their critique and kind of ran with it would see a problem with reading because they would also see it as a, a being put into a, a receptive mode and that it is uh, still an alienation from the real world. Um, I, I think that uh, that you can look at it in a matter of degrees, whereby a um, <clears throat> reading a book still allows, still calls for you to be a participant in that activity because you need to construct what the what the words are saying as images in your mind. <clears throat> Whereas watching television or watching a movie does not require that. It shows you everything exactly as the producer wanted you to see it. Um, next question: What the situation is called themselves? Uh, I would imagine they call them. Would, each individual would call themselves either, either an artist, a Marxist, an autonomous. They would call themselves whatever they chose to. There's, there's not an name at all. Uh, it's everybody else calls it situationism. They were probably just trying to piss you off by saying there was no such thing as situationism. Um, and the third question was the transition from self-sacrifice and revolution. Okay, um, that's a tough one to answer. I would say that, um, that, yeah, that, that of course a certain degree of self-sacrifice 
is implied, but not the radical self-sacrifice that is proposed by, say, uh, Christianity when they say, like, no, you need to have total self-sacrifice because the paradise will come in the hereafter. Or the, you know, even authoritarian socialists um, who think that there needs to be total self-sacrifice self in order for the revolution to be attained because after that then we will see the realization of, of justice or, or what have you. That I, I don't, that to make an absolute statement to say there can be no self-sacrifice I don't think works, but I think it's a matter of degrees. Is, is there an approach to sort of ethically adjudicating what's appropriate? Um, I would say what the individual finds appropriate. I don't know though. Greg? Well, Will had his hand up earlier. Uh, I was just going to say, I wonder if it's, maybe situationists do really focus on desires a lot. I don't know, I've never read anything by any of them, but it seems like it's almost more important to focus on values, like what are bourgeois values, what are working class values, and as a result of living in a capitalist society, we kind of internalize bourgeois values, so we do think it is important to maybe um, have a big house or you know, drive a car that's nicer than our neighbor and all these different things. And so I think if, um, you know, in a more egalitarian society or in, a, in you know, after a revolution, for example, um, you know, the idea is that the values, people's values would radically change when the mode of, of production changes and that we'd have you know, better values where we'd actually care for each other, we'd be more interested in, you know, making sure that everyone had, you know, what they needed to survive, that people had health care or whatever, as opposed to primarily being concerned with, you know, getting rich or, uh, you know, getting plastic surgery or different things like that. Um, this is a little bit related, um, and it's along this question. Uh, for the spectacle, I believe you said that it was um, a prevailing mode of social life which then in turn justifies the already made decision mm -hmm. for that mode of life. Yeah. Um, this is actually linked to your previous question, which was, or uh, your response, which was, well, um, flat screen televisions are pushed by bourgeois society. Um, and if you'll forgive me for being the dogmatic orthodox Marxist, um, in Marx, there's a distinction made between the base and the superstructure, right? Which it seems that the situation has seemed to buy which is, there's a base, which is our actual mode of economic production. When we go to the factory, what sort of house we live in, what sort of food we live in, that is itself a pure economic consideration, right? Our exploitation by capital, the imperialist wars, et cetera, et cetera. But then there's also a superstructure, which is the entire legal, social, political, artistic construct that it arises out of this base. Now, they're not causally linked, right? The superstructure has some autonomy from the base, um, just like, Right, there's plenty of movies in which corporations are the bad guys, but still function to serve capital. Um, if the superstructure or, or if the, the base of producing flat screens for the sake of a superstructure of distributing puerile television is itself a bourgeois construction, why is not, and again, I, I'm sorry, this is an unfair way to catch it, uh, couch it, but this is the way it seems to me, why is then a, an elitist um, self-important bourgeois ideology which fundamentally rejects it seems the actual consciousness of the mass right their ability to know in fact what is best from them uh, why is that construct of the superstructure then independent of bourgeois production when it not only comes from not just a bourgeois society but in fact right most of the situationists Guy Debord especially right had a bourgeois background what then separates that ideology from the plasma television. Well, what would separate any ideology from that? What would separate Maoism from that? What would separate Marx from that? Well, I mean, that, it seems that what separates um, Marxism from, say, situationism is... What, no, what separates, what separates Maoism from, like, if, that, if you're saying that situationism is just a product of the mode of production, right? right then so must be Maoism, so must be Marxism, because these are all things that came about after the capitalist bourgeois revolution. Right, but of course, I'm not making, I'm not making the claim that there are true and false desires, right, bourgeois or, you know, authentic desires, right. 
Maoism and Marxism, as I understand it, buys into the fact that, as a matter of fact, all of our current desires under capitalism are capitalist desires, right? This is what differentiates them from Negri and Hart and the Situationists. Um, but they, as an ideology, return to the base where, and again, right, not as familiar as you, um, perhaps you could instantate for me where situation, situationism returns to the base in a substantive way to alter those fundamental modes of production. To alter the fundamental modes of production. Right. In, in the dogmatic sense, the base rather than the superstructure. Because it seems like this is focused on superstructure, art, politics. Uh, okay, I agree that the artistic branch uh, was focused on the superstructure. I do not agree that the, that the political aspects are focused on the superstructure. I believe they go right to the base by advocating uh, the abolition of by advocating the abolition of, of capitalism through the implementation of council communism. It's, uh, I don't see any great divergence from, you know, even Marx on that. No, please, we... Yeah, I'm, I can't but help but think about the sort of situation of something like Mardi Gras, as opposed to the Lent. Um, it's been the case throughout history that there has been these moments under which people can react under what situationists might call real desires. You know, not the ability to buy things, but the ability to engage in these sort of Bacchanalian revelries that kind of exist outside of it, uh, outside of the sort of regular day-to-day -day of purchase and, well, you know, you're a slave and this is what you need to do and things like this, right? You know, specifically in Greece, you have the city Dionysia, which is the festival under which they wheel a giant stone phallus from the Apollonian, you know, Acropolis to Dionysian theories, where we have, I mean, just these sort of base pleasures, food, orgy, plays, authentic sort of actions and things like this. But it seems to me like the reason that that's necessary, the reason why that's even desirable, is to reinforce the other 356 days, uh, 354 days or whatever the year. So it seems to me like this notion of these quote unquote authentic, and I don't, you, you haven't used the word authentic, I'm importing that, but you know, like these sort of authentic events of, of discovering or getting at the real pleasure only serve or even, or even only generate as a result of the rest of the, the year. I mean, and so in a way, these festivals are necessary. These people with their like sunscreens and stuff like this, right? What happens is they go that they're like, oh, the bell rang. Okay, guys, let's go out and show them how we're not a part of the system. And then they take off their clothes and put on a bathing suit and a thing. And then when the second bell rings, they get back to work. I mean, and that's the case behind Mardi Gras, right? Because right after that's the Lent. That's the idea behind the city Dionysia. And even these sort of random festivals that happen in our society, these situational events, right? The revolution does not occur after that. 68, you pointed out, like, isn't that the perfect culmination of situationism and its failure? Um, okay. Yeah, so you're just basically pointing out the fact that, um, <clears throat> that you know, these celebrations where we celebrate our base desires don't always don't don't uh, don't turn into revolutionary situations and are basically co-opted by the established order, right? Right. That 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 it's a, that it's necessary that we allow for these things so that so that capitalism can continue. So it's just like an outlet or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, I, I would say that the that uh, that the same critique could be leveled at revolution in general, right? That the up that the masses uh, occasionally will 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 rise up, and that uh, those th that actually capitalism, that the ruling order requires those things in order to keep itself functioning. Because then it says, oh, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll change a little bit, or we'll put like, you know, some new bosses in. But the, the, the fundamental order of things is not greatly altered by those. The situationists are not saying that every, that every celebration of base desires will, should, should or would result in a revolution. They're saying that, that there, that this ideology, that Marxist ideolo ideology, should be combined with those base desires and should become a part of those celebrations in order to convert them into a revolutionary practice. I, I don't think that the carnival, as it were, right, or uh, the situational events necessarily lead to revolution. It's got to be way more than that. So that was not my claim, to be fair. And also, if, if the idea is, well, what about the Marxists and things like that? I mean, 
okay, fine, there can be criticisms leveled that the revolution hasn't happened globally and things like this. But before capitalism, there was something else. It was feudalism, and there was a revolutionary event that occurred that mm -hmm. allowed that transition to occur. So, I mean, if your idea is that revolution can't happen, I'm going to just have to say it wrong. My, re my statement was not that revolution cannot happen. My statement was that revolution often does not result in a in a liberat in, in liberation of the masses, right? The bourgeois revolution did not sure. result in, in the liberation of of the peasants of the workers. They just simply were uh, taken into a new mode. Of yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I was confused as to there's, there's often capitalist sponsored revolutions or a revolution will take place right. and then capitalism mm -hmm. adopts it. The civil rights revolution, revolution is not a revolution exactly. necessarily. Um, Nate, um, <clears throat> I just. I mean, I'll admit, as the right, uh, a Marxist, um, but also not a very good one. I, I just want to clarify here something so I can understand your critique, Greg. Um, and I, I too am suspicious of what sounds to me like this this idea of authenticity for the situationist. But you you were saying, uh, what, what would uh, how would we distinguish between a false desire or Right, a, 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 an authentic desire and a non-authentic desire. Um, with, with my limited reading of, of Marx, right, am I not mistaken that he specifically he specifically also names the production of false desires? So, uh, as an orthodox Marxist, isn't there a, a Marxist notion of false desires inherent in that? Well, if I may, well. Um, here, here's a big distinction, right? What Marx is talking about is desires uh, above subsistence, right? So, yeah, if you're talking about bare subsistence, okay, food, clothing, shelter, medicine. Um, however, right, post that, right, Marx is, is very quick to point out that there are plenty of socialist ideologies that are, in fact, bourgeois. There are plenty of revolutionary movements that are ostensibly anti-capitalist, but also serve capitalist ends. Um, so in this case, right, the higher superstructure desires of law, of art, right, are themselves, right, above the base, right? The base is bare subsistence, right? And this would be the truth of the matter. I mean, this is one of the core components of the Marxian thesis, which is it's the means of production, the modes of production that really call the shots, not eternally, not universally, not without resistance and autonomy among governments, but also call the shots on our day-to-day -day life. We think that it's the politicians that matter, but in fact, it's the corporations and the factories that matter. Right, so this, I think, would be the distinction Marx would make, but not some sort of coarse uh, moralism dressed up as, not that I'm saying you hold this position, but not to have a coarse moralism dressed up in the terms of authenticity. Um, yeah, kind of, all right, so one of the, the big notions out of situationist theory, uh, Van Eyck touches on this in Revolutionary to Life, but it's radical subjectivity, right? If, if I, correctly, the general idea is, right, you're living yourself authentically unalienated by the spectacle, and, and that in and of itself, right, that becomes your resistance to capitalism, and good for you, right? And this sort of notion gets picked up, and it, it's, it's, I mean, it, the worst of the worst currents of American anarchism, right, crime think, like, they run wild with this shit. Like, it's like, oh my god, we, we dropped out of capital, and now we've, we've won. Like, uh, check out our punk anarchist squats, and, you know, we've basically, you know, why even bother? Like, everybody can do this, too, right? It, all you need to do is quit your job and jump on rooftops, and, well, there you go. Um, these are more comments, I guess, at this point. But actually, the other, the other the actual thing I want to bring up, too, right? Um, this notion of what, you know, we, what are their desires, like, specifically, I know we've kind of, like, danced around this, but... Uh, Lacan, right, uh, he, he, was, he was around then, um, May 68, and they're like, yo, Lacan, like, what, what's going on here? He's like, well, there's, it's simple, right? What you want is a new master. That, that's pretty much it. And uh, again, they, I think that basically the fact is it's like they desire something. They don't know what they desire, but in essence, what they want is a new master. So. Is that a question? No, I'm just, it's more of a general comment, so. It's more. Um, I have two things to say. 
One, I don't think we're ever, like, I mean, we have this discussion about authenticity or not, and I think um, even without having to say something is authentic, we can say it, that we, that we might prefer to have our desires not mediated by bourgeois culture. Um, and I can also say, like, I, I find this, like, to be an incredibly compelling and interesting um, topic, just because we're never going to convert the masses to socialism um, unless people are reached on some sort of, like, a deep emotional level, on a personal level, to, to this idea that there's something genuinely in it for them. And I, to me, it sounds like that's what this is all about. Um, and I, 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 like, I don't know how to connect that to the rest of Marx's theory. And it, to me, it seems like the biggest problem is, is the question of what, what is isn't bourgeois culture. Um, and I mean, every culture that's come before bourgeois, bourgeois culture, I'm not sure I can say I would prefer, um, particularly as a woman, um, that, that it just hasn't turned out so, uh, like, we don't have anything better. We know that a lot of things are culturally based, but we don't, we don't even know what a culture that isn't terrible would look like. Do you, like, is there a situationist answer to building that? Other, because I don't think, because our de desires are so mediated, I think I, I think on a pretty deep level about bourgeois culture even now. Mm -hmm. Like how how do you build something that's different? Mm. Uh, as far as how the situationist would answer that question, um, I'm not actually sure. Does anybody else know more than I do about that? No, I don't know. I mean, I have my own ideas about that, but it's, it's not really based on situationism, so. Greg? Do you want to take Greg and then we can move on? Um, probably the, the key text to look at is Society of the Spectacle, and also, um, I believe it's literally a, a chapter on council communism. And the position that they have, right, is that by having council communism, you don't have representation, but you have direct presentation of political will. Um, which avoids the alienating effects of capital because it would avoid reification, it would avoid um, uh, commodity fetishism, it would avoid any psychological fetishism of leader, right, because the direct political will would be immediately instantiated. And so, um, right, for the situationists, the core of capitalism and why it's actually so clever is because it allows a, it, it reifies relations among commodities to look like, or uh, among people to look like relations on commodities. But if you have direct presentation rather than representation, then you don't run into the danger of this reified, alienated political situation. I mean, isn't that? That'd be that position. How, how is that different though? Like the, the things that I'm, the Marxist philosophy that I'm hearing you, you talk about in the principles, how are they not normative? I mean, it seems to me like you're criticizing situationism for being normative, and it seems to me that, that Marxism is inherently normative. It's a, um, I would ask Chris and Nate, is it all right if I answer this? Um, actually, no. My, my critique of uh, situationism, uh, situationism isn't that it's normative. My critique of situationism is that it's bad. It's really bad. And its in entire focus on alien unalienated culture and the individual and individual self-expression are, are, are bad and are not going to get us anywhere. And if we do the things that they tell us to do at the absolute best, we're going to get May 68. And for all of the authenticity one can have, um, I'm in it to win it. And I don't care about authenticity, and I don't care about lack of alienation. Uh, I want a revolution, and I want to destroy capital. And if that's alienated, if that's a spectacle, uh, I don't care. So, I mean, that would be boiled down my core critique of situationism at its most brute form. Which, again, is maybe not as sophisticated as people well, would like. I, I guess Actually, um, I want to move on. Oh.